Hello and welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. I'm Matt Emerson, one of the uh, directors at CBR, and I'm joined by Luke Stamps, who is also uh, one of our directors at the Center. And the Center for Baptist Renewal is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for the renewal of Baptist faith and practice. If you enjoy what you hear today, we invite you to check out our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. And you can also follow us on Twitter at, at Baptist Renewal and on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Baptist Renewal. And don't forget to subscribe, tell your friends all about it. Uh, in today's show, we are discussing Cyril of Alexandria's On the Unity of Christ. This is part of our 2021 reading challenge. Uh, we have fallen a little bit behind in terms of the schedule, but uh, I think this was May's book. We're into June now, but uh, hopefully those of you who haven't read it yet and you're catching up on your reading, this will benefit you as you do that. And if you have already read it, uh, we hope that this will still uh, help you in terms of understanding what you've read and moving forward, how to, how to think about Cyril. So uh, we want to start with just talking briefly about Cyril's life, and then we'll move uh, into the book. And so uh, Cyril uh, was a church leader from... Uh, really from the beginning of the fourth century towards the middle, or fifth century, excuse me, towards the middle, uh, born around 376. He ended up being the patriarch of Alexandria, a church leader in that city, bishop, uh, essentially. And uh, he is known especially for his defense of Christological orthodoxy, what we would call Christological orthodoxy now, against his opponent, Nestorius. And uh, there really are a number of different controversies and conflicts that Cyril is involved in, but the, the most well-known of those is about the two natures of Christ and their hypostatic union in the one person of Jesus of Nazareth. And, you know, when we talk about Cyril, a closely related conversation is the Council of Chalcedon, and at the Council of Chalcedon, there's lots of uh, language from Cyril that's used in uh, formulating the Chalcedonian definition. And just very briefly, uh, a summary of the Chalcedonian definition, in case you're unfamiliar with that, would simply be this, that Jesus Christ is one person with two natures, hypostatically united, without separation or division, mixture or change. And so... Uh, the two natures of Jesus, human nature, divine nature, they exist in the one person of Jesus. There are not two persons of Jesus, one human, one divine. There's one person, and those natures exist hypostatically united, there, and that hypostatic union happens without separating the natures, dividing them into two, and without mixing them together to make some kind of third thing or without changing the natures uh, where the divine nature sort of becomes human or vice versa. Uh, so uh, Cyril is closely related to the Council of Chalcedon that articulates that formula. And um, the truth is though, that most people kind of gloss over uh, or, or don't know is that Cyril died uh, seven years before the Council of Chalcedon. So he wasn't actually present at the Council of Chalcedon. He was, however, present uh, uh, or, or influential, highly influential and alive during the Council of Ephesus in 431, 20 years before Chalcedon. And um, that council was consumed with the question of whether or not Mary can be referred to using the term Theotokos. And uh, Nestorius famously was against this term uh, Cyril is for it. We'll get sort of into more of these arguments as we as we work through the book, but to break it down uh, just briefly, Nestorius didn't want to call Mary the uh, Theotokos. He preferred the term Christotokos uh, because uh, that means Christ-bearer, whereas Theotokos means God-bearer, and Nestorius's argument is, well, God can't be born. Um, it's the human nature of Jesus that's born of a, of a virgin of Mary. And so he preferred to use that term Christotokos to be clear, well, it's, it's the human nature or uh, Jesus the human that's being born uh, in, in the birth of Christ. Whereas, uh, whereas Cyril's argument is, no, Jesus is one person with two natures. He always is that one person with those two natures. And so Theotokos is appropriate because Jesus is God incarnate 
And therefore, Mary does bear God in her womb, according to the human nature of Jesus Christ. And uh, so that was the, the council uh, that, that Cyril's alive for and uh, is very influential at. Uh, the argument for Theotokos wins the day. Um, many, much of this is wrapped up in some other um, historical happenings that we'll, we'll get more into, including the relationship between Alexandria and Antioch. Um, but for now, that's a sort of very brief overview of what's going on in Cyril's life. He's a church leader, a patriarch, or a bishop in Alexandria. He's opposed uh, primarily by this other patriarch, Nestorius, who's in Constantinople. Uh, and uh, that, that also includes the school of Alexandria uh, and their kind of way of reading scripture and uh, the d distinction between that and the school of Antioch by which Nestorius was heavily influenced, uh, especially by Diodor and Theodore, uh, who Luke referred to before this as the uh, Antiochian chipmunks. Um, so so that's, a, that's a very brief overview. Anything you wanna add there, Luke, about Cyril's life, just to get us introduced to him and, and, and what's going on with him? Yeah, no, I think that's a good summary. Okay, so jumping into the book itself then, uh, there are a number of ways that we could talk about the book, but Luke, why don't you walk us through some of the main themes and then we'll dig into some quotes. Yeah, so the name of the book uh, sort of gives away the emphasis a lot of ways, right, on, on the unity of Christ. Um, as we think about how the, the doctrine of the hypostatic union sort of comes full flower in uh, 451, the Council of Chalcedon, it, you know, it's trying to hold together both unity and distinction, right, the unity of the person, but also the distinction of the natures. Um, Cyril is, I think, consistent with that. As you mentioned, Cyril comes before Chalcedon. So it, it, it's anachronistic if we read too much of Chalcedon sort of back into Cyril, although Cyril's influence is obviously uh, transparent um, at, at Chalcedon. But, you know, Cyril is kind of a step on the way historically and theologically to Chalcedon. But it, if we were to think about the emphasis for Cyril, uh, it's not so much the distinction of the natures, although we find that there, it's important that we note that, but the, the emphasis, the focus is on the unity of Christ because the challenge of his day, as you've spelled out, was Nestorius, um, who was the, uh, the Archbishop of Constantinople and you know, famously, as you said, den denies this title to Mary, Theotokos. The, the, the controversy is not really over Mariology, but over Christology. Right, so there, it's not. We sometimes think, well, that's a Catholic thing to call, you know, Mary the Mother of God, or you know, the Greek Orthodox sometimes just leave it untranslated, the, the Theotokos. Um, but it's not so much about Mary as it is about Jesus, right? The one, the one that's born in Mary's womb. That's the that's the the issue. And so, the 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 argument that that Cyril is laying out here is directly uh, in um, in contradiction to what Nestorius had argued, it, at least, at least um, arguably. I mean, there has been some revisionist history about Nestorius. Some, some scholars have tried to say that maybe Nestorius wasn't as Nestorian as he's made out to be. Uh, these kinds of arguments sometimes get made. Uh, at the very least, I think we could say that Nestorius was unclear and when confronted and challenged and corrected, remained unclear in ways that were unhelpful. So uh, I'm not a historian uh, by training, and so I, I'll leave that to the historians to, to hash that out. But certainly the, the error of Nestorianism that Cyril is attacking here is a, a, a way of dividing, the, to put it in, in crude terms, sort of dividing the natures of Christ so much uh, that essentially you're talking about two persons. And, and Diodor of Tarsus, who you mentioned, uh, even spoke about uh, two sons, right? So you have the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, uh, the Son of the Father, and then the Son of Mary. And so that, that, that you really have two sons, two persons, who somehow have a relationship with each other. So the person of the Son is, is in some way indwelling or, or is conjoined to or associated with this already existing human person, Jesus. So, such that he can be the conduit of the Son of God's uh, redeeming work on earth. Uh, but 
that that would make Jesus then a mere man who is simply empowered by by God. And so uh, there are all kinds of heresies that had already arisen in the church, really centuries early earlier. Um, if you're familiar with these these sorts of uh, early church heresies, where people had already kind of suggested that Jesus was merely a man who was empowered by God. People had already suggested that Jesus was an already existing human person who was adopted by God uh, in some ways to, to be the conduit of his redeeming work. And so what Cyril is picking up on here is that if you, if you, if you strain the distinction so much, right, you end up with two persons and you, in losing the unity of the person you, of Christ, you, you lose the, the saving benefit. Right. So, I mean, one of the things that he emphasizes here is in emphasizing that it's it's not just a it's not just a conjunction of divinity and humanity or an association of divinity and humanity, but an actual union in the person of the son. Right. The, the emphasis on unity is so important because our salvation is at stake. Right. Our, our reunion with God, we could say, is at stake in the union of divinity and humanity in the person of the son, because if it's not the if it's not. The, if it's not a divine person who we're dealing with in Jesus of Nazareth, if it's not a divine person that we see, you know, walking and talking and healing and exercising demons and then preeminent, preeminently dying on the cross and being raised from the dead as our representative and substitute, if it's not a divine person doing those things, then it's just a mere man. A mere man empowered by God can't be the redeemer of the world. It has to be God himself right, who's doing this work, and so the unity of the person becomes so crucial because, you know, really our salvation is at stake. I'm sorry, but every time you say mere man, I can't help but think of Zoolander, merman. <laughs> merman, pop, merman. Anyway, I apologize. I'm not, okay. a, I'm not a serious person or thinker or scholar, so. I mean, it's not really, it's not really a podcast from that if there's not an anchor man quote or a Zoolander quote, something in, in that genre. Parks and Rec. Mid-2000s uh, lowbrow comedy. Ricky. But hey, I'm here for it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, really, what's motivating uh, Cyril um, is, is soteriological, has to do with salvation. Uh, it has to do with our, un our union with God is dependent upon this union of, of the two natures in the, in the one person of Christ. And so it's not the, the, the thing that I think pe people who aren't uh, as familiar with um, with theology or with the history of doctrine, they can sometimes at first think, isn't this nitpicking? I mean, it seems like Nestorius was trying, you know, he was trying to be biblical. Again, there's some debate about, you know, exactly what he meant by this. Uh, isn't this sort of theological nitpicking? And, and Cyril is saying, no, it's not, it's not right. It's, it's actually hugely important. Uh, that the person that we see in the Gospels doing this work and the person who is now raised to the Father's right hand interceding for us as our mediator, as our great high priest, that person who is alive and lives forevermore is a divine person. He's not just a human who has a relationship to God, but he is God in the flesh. So anyway, that's that's kind of a summary of the the, the yeah. major themes. Yeah, that's good. So I've written down some things we can talk about, you know, more and more a more granular way. But. Right. So uh, there are a few key terms uh, that that Cyril uses, and you know, some of that has been a lot of it has been adopted and was like we both said so far, uh, highly influential at Chalcedon. Things like uh, the uh, the union of the natures, henosis, the hypostatic union, um, the way that he the way that he uh, <clears throat> has this uh, soteriological motivation that you've talked about here. He's his opposition to Apollinarianism is highly influential uh, at Chalcedon and beyond that. Um, and but you know especially his use of parted of exegesis sort of positively speaking in terms of the way that um, can I stop you right there yeah yeah just to say something uh, you mentioned Apollinarianism uh, we haven't said anything about that yet uh, but just to tease that out uh, Apollinaris was a fourth century uh, heretic uh, who who argued that 
in, in, in the incarnation, God the Son only assumed a human body and not also a human soul, the sort of higher part of, of the human soul. Um, and, in, and in Apollinaris' uh, understanding, the person of the Son sort of takes the place of the soul and he just assumes a human body. And sometimes Cyril, Cyril himself was sometimes accused of being Apollinarian because he, in, in so emphasizing the, the unity of the person, uh, the, the tendency, at least potentially, is to sort of lose the full humanity of, 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 of Christ. And so it's important to recognize as, as you work through this book, there are a number of places where, where Cyril explicitly and emphatically rejects the Apollinarian heresy. So he's not suggesting, and, and emphasizing unity, he's not suggesting that somehow the, the, the integrity of the complete human nature of Christ is, is in jeopardy or is being lost. He still affirms uh, full, true, integral human nature, body and soul, that is that that's the nature that's being united to the person in, in the hypostatic union. So anyway, I just think that's important to, to recognize. He's trying to steer this middle path then in a way between Apollinarian, Apollinarianism on the one hand uh, that would emphasize unity at, at the loss of distinction and uh, Nestorianism on the other hand that is emphasizing distinction at the loss of unity. So in emphasizing unity, he's not actually letting go of distinction. Uh, it's just that's what he's emphasizing against the Nestorians. Yeah, that's right. And so in doing so, uh, he also employs uh, what we call now partitive exegesis. And so, that, well, I mean, I'm sure we've talked about this in other episodes, um, so I don't want to belabor defining it, but essentially <clears throat> it's a distinction, it's a, it's a mechanism for reading scripture in such a way that we distinguish between when scripture speaks of Christ acting according to his human nature and when speaking of Christ acting according to his divine nature. And Augustine adds a, uh, so Augustine uh, uses Philippians 2 language there, form of a servant to, to uh, refer to the occasions when scripture speaks of uh, Christ acting according to his human nature and form of God when Christ is acting according to his divine nature. He adds a third category, form of begottenness, uh, to refer to when, uh, to refer to the times when scripture speaks of Christ's um, eternal generation from the Father as God the Son. Um, so we won't really get into that third one too much, but those two, those first two categories are really important for Cyril. So maybe if you want to say anything else about that or give us some examples uh, from the text as to how Cyril employs that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wrote down some examples uh, before we jumped on this morning, and they're all over the place. So whenever I first read this book, I just kind of wrote, every time I saw it, I wrote it in the margins, part of the exegesis, part of the exegesis. So it's like, you know, page 66, page 100, 102, 107, 110, 126, 127, 130. I mean, and, and there are others <laughs> that I've missed here, I'm sure. Um, but it's interesting that he employs this, this reading strategy, because again, a lot of times people will accuse, um, well, or misunderstand, I think, um, part of exegesis, people will say, well, aren't you just dividing Christ, right? If you're saying like this passage is about the human nature doing something and this passage is about the divine nature doing something, which that right there is a, is a mistake, right? A mistake in, in language. The natures don't do things. The person is the one who does things under the aspect of his humanity or under the aspect of his divinity. Um, but it's interesting that in a number of places, Cyril, who is the arch anti-Nestorian, right? He, he, is, he is the central figure in the Nestorian controversy opposing Nestorianism. But Cyril says things that sometimes uh, modern uh, theologians and commentators will accuse of being Nestorian. Like sometimes people think that party of exegesis is basically Nestorian, right? Because you're saying over here, the human nature is doing something, over there, the divine nature is doing something. Therefore, you're dividing Christ into two persons. Party of exegesis is Nestorian. It's almost yeah. like it's almost like calling Ronald Reagan a communist if he ever said anything about helping people or something like right. that. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's a fundamental misunderstanding. People do the same thing with Nestorius also. I don't know if we'll get into this. Maybe we'll get into it later. With the canonic theory. Right. So just just a little preview there. If we get to this, the canonic theory basically says that in order to become incarnate, God the Son had to give up certain attributes. 
he sort of had to contract himself down to the size of a human, so to speak. So he had to give up the omni attributes, omnip omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, so that he could live within the constraints of an ordinary human life. That's the 19th and 20th century canonic theory. And I, one book defending this view uh, I read years ago um, says that if you if you deny that and you say and if you say that the Son of God continues to carry out his divine functions as God, um, the so-called extra Calvinisticum, which we've talked about in another episode. If you want to learn more about that, go watch the episode or listen to the episode on Athanasius uh, on the Incarnation. We talked about the extra Calvinisticum there, but it's ba basically this idea that the Son of God is continuing to, to be God. He doesn't stop being God in order, to be, in order to become a human, but he continues to be God, upholding the universe by the word of his power, Hebrews 1, 4, etc., but anyway, this one canonic theorist basically says that if you deny that, you're you're Nestorian. And in I, I kid you not, Matt, in in driving home this point, this this uh, canonic New Testament scholar cites Cyril of Alexandria as evidence of the Nestorian tendency of the tradition uh, to emphasize this point about. The, the extra Calvinisticum. Uh, and he quotes something from Cyril. I, it may be from this book. I can't remember where, but it's basically where Cyril says that at the same time that he was an infant nursing at Mary's breast, he was also upholding the stars above or something like that. And this, this particular uh, New Testament scholar says, well, that's an historian. I mean, if he's down <laughs> as a baby and he's up there, you know, upholding the stars, then you have two persons. Oh, and in order to avoid that, we have to espouse the canonic theory. But it was Cyril that he quoted in defense of that. So uh, I, just, obviously I, just, I just want to briefly add to that point a little soapbox of mine, which is that we proof text historical sources as badly or worse than we proof text the Bible as evangelicals. Evangelicals don't know the tradition. They don't understand the tradition. They don't read in context and they control F and PDF documents or on CCEL and try to find a phrase and then uh, that's it. They, they found where it says subordination. So therefore everybody always believed EFS or something like that. And it's just, that's not how you do historical theology. Right. Yeah. I've been trying to persuade Matt to write an essay called control F historical theology. Uh, Cause this is a point he makes a lot that you're just sort of, you're hunting for a particular uh, you know, proof text in order to make you know you say well hey we've got the tradition on our side you yeah. know and obviously i stated that a bit strongly obviously there are many evangelicals uh, evangelical scholars who are interested in historical theology and do it well i don't mean to say nobody does it well but uh, it is a tendency i think among evangelicals rooted in our kind of uh, contrarian spirit with respect to tradition to yeah to avoid studying historical theology and only reference it when we're trying to support our own point that we've already come to a conclusion about and trying to find a quote to support it from somebody. And that almost always results in us misquoting somebody from the tradition. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I sort of a little dig there emphasizing that he's a New Testament scholar. Um, not all New Testament scholars do this either, but there, there it is sort of, just to add, add on to that, an unfortunate byproduct of the division of labor in the modern theological encyclopedia that sometimes people who are specialists in uh, the New Testament, early Christianity, Greek literature, you know, uh, Greek language backgrounds, et cetera, who, who might be, you know, fine scholars in, in, in those areas, but when they, or dipping into other areas uh, and trying to draw on them, which is commendable, right? This is, I mean, I think we need to bring down some of those walls and silos and so on. But if they're not carefully attending to the specialists in those other areas, and they end up making those kinds of missteps. And and listen, I, I'm not, again, I, I've tried to admit here, I'm not a historian. Uh, I mean, I, my undergrad's in history, but my, my terminal de degree is not in history. I'm not a New Testament scholar. Um, and so I want to really be reliant upon those who are um, so that I don't make those kinds of mis missteps. And so we just need to talk to each other. I mean, I think that's uh, and learn from each other. 
we need to to model that. I think um, if you're special, if you're if you're special, if your specialty is in one area, you need to read the experts in the other. Um, yeah. But anyway, that's just an aside because uh, yeah, there are lots of systematic theologians who misread the, the history of doctrine as well. So it's not like it's just New Testament people, right? But, so uh, we were getting to some examples of part of the Jesus. So yeah, a long, a long excursus there. Yeah, sorry. Uh, but, no, it's fine. Um, I mean, I, I, I could just pick a few at random, really, to kind of give you a flavor um, of, what, of what he does here. So on page 66 in, in the Popular Patristics series. I'm going to interrupt you one more time just to tell you that I just got a notification from Chick-fil-A to say it's National Best Friends Day. I'm glad we're doing this podcast right now, soul friend. We should go get some Chick-fil-A and eat it virtually together. Because I have enough points to send you a milkshake. But maybe I should just use those points for myself. Yeah, that would be fine. All right, part of exegesis. So anyway, this is uh, on page 66. He says, we ourselves also admit that the titles of the divine perfections are common to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we crown begetter, that's the Father, with equal glories to the one begotten from him and the, and the Holy Spirit too. Nonetheless, dear friends, I would say that the title Christ and that which it signifies, that is an anointing, really do apply only, really do apply to the only begotten after the manner of his self-emptying. So there's a couple things going on there. One is um, a doctrine we haven't really talked about yet, but it's, it's known as the communication of attributes, the communicatio idiomatum, the communication of attributes, where properties of both natures uh, and even titles of that would be proper to both natures are attributable to the same person, right? Because it's the one person of the Son who has two natures. Then things we would say about the divine nature, like he's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent, are attributable to the person of the Son because he has the divine nature. He is the divine nature, in fact, uh, in a filial mode. Um, so so the, the things that are true of the divine nature are certainly attributable to the person of the Son, but also things that are true of the human nature, that he's weak, he grows tired, hungry, thirsty, he suffers, he dies, he's, he's raised from the dead. Those human things that we say about Jesus are also attributable to the person of the Son, because he's the only person there, right? Um, and so because he's one person, the properties of both natures are attributable to the one person of the son. That's what he's saying here, that even though Christ, the anointed one, this Davidic title is true of God, the son, after the manner of his self-emptying, that is after the manner of his incarnation, it's still attrib attributable to the one person of the son. Uh, so that's one thing that's going on here is the communication of attributes. But, th but then he's also uh, emphasizing here that we say that about the son according to his human nature. That's what he means when he says, after the manner of his self-emptying. So there are certain things that the scriptures say about the Son of God that are true of him only under the aspect of one or the other nature. So that's just one example. Let me just give one more. He says on page 100, um, he says, he says that he was sanctified insofar he was man, but sanctifies in so far as he is understood as God. As I have said, he was both the one and the other in the same person. Okay, so, so some things are said about the person of the son, the same person, not two persons, right? The, but some things are said about the person of the son in so far as he is God, and other things are said about the son in so far as he is man. And there's a number of places where he does this throughout the book. As I, as I said, I mentioned several uh, places here where he's doing the same thing. He's reading, uh, you know, things that, like the fact that the, the Son of God dies, that's true of the Son of God only in reference to his uh, human nature. The Son of God created the world. That's true of the Son of God only in reference to his, to his divine nature. That same, that same thing we saw, as you mentioned in Augustine earlier with the Cappadocian Fathers back in the fourth century, and then also here in the fifth century, we'll see it um, if, you, if you study the Council of Chalcedon with Pope Leo the Great uh, and his tome that was a, a part of the, the proceedings of the Council of Chalcedon, where you attribute the glories to the divine nature, the, uh, the sufferings to the human nature, not because they're two persons, 
but because the one person uh, has two natures. So some things we say about him under the aspect of his divinity, some things under the aspect of his humanity. And there are examples that are just sort of chock full. This book is chock full with examples of, of Cyril making that kind of exegetical maneuver. Yeah, that's good. And so, and that carries forward through the rest of the tradition into, I mean, into Protestant tradition as well. Uh, although Luther, you know, we would have some serious disagreements with his Christology. Uh, he has a, a fairly famous statement where he says, God died on the cross in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's making this point, yeah. not necessarily in exactly the same language that we're using right now, but just, just that um, according to the human nature of Jesus, Jesus died, obviously, and therefore we can say in some sense God died on the cross and that God incarnate died according to the human nature of Jesus of Nazareth. And, and the New Testament does that as well, right? The New Testament, in the book of Acts, Acts 17, I think it is, where, where is it that Paul speaks to the Ephesian elders? 20. Acts, Acts 20. Acts 17 is the Areopagus. Acts 20, um, Paul That's talks about I, God. I, I read the Bible, unlike you systematic <laughs> theologian. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so Paul says that God shed his blood mm. in Acts 20. Mm -hmm. Later in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that the Lord of glory died. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a, those are biblical examples of this idea of, of the communication of attributes. That in both of those cases, the person of the Son is named right. using a title according to his divinity, God in Acts 20, the Lord of glory in 1 Corinthians. But what is said about him in those contexts are things that can only be true of the person of the Son in virtue of or under the aspect of his humanity, that right. he bled, that he was crucified. Right. I mean, that, yeah. That's a New Testament pattern. It's not just invented by the church fathers. Yeah. And the alternative is that God somehow is material. And you know, like the Greek gods has golden blood flowing through his veins or whatever, um, which is just ridiculous. Uh, so... I, I think, well, maybe we'll get, have time to get to canonicism in a minute, but that's that's part of my my issue with canonic Christology, with uh, the kind of attempt to reject a lot of the categories of classical Christian theism, including things like infassibility and immutability. Um, is there are, there are good reasons to think that uh, the biblical writers, even though they're using analogical language. Or in this instance, they're using, uh, or we'd have to employ partitive exegesis properly to understand some of their statements. Even in those cases where there's some affinity with, say, Greek mythology, if you just go read Greek mythology, it's obvious that the New Testament writers and the Old Testament writers, even, even though that would be anachronistic, say they're opposing Greek mythology particularly, but other kinds of um, other, other mythologies from other cultures where the gods are somehow bodily and they they are uh, they're uh, you know basically emotional babies and this sort of thing um it's very obvious that the biblical writers are opposing those kinds of ways of talking about god even if there are certain terms or phrases or whatever where it's either where it's where it's either analogical language that's being used so god's nose is long or something like this or in the case of acts 20 and in, in ephesians etc where we need to employ part of exegesis to understand them properly. Um, so that's also a, a soapbox and an aside that we'll move on from. Uh, one thing that we need to talk about before we end is uh, Cyril's use, a very controversial term, which is miaphysis, or if you prefer miaphysis, I, I don't really care. Uh, he uses this term miaphysis, which many today, uh, what Matt? what is what does miaphysis mean so uh one one nature or something like this um where people accuse cyril of not being sort of chalcedonian enough even though that's anachronistic because he's he dies prior to chalcedon uh, and then uh, people also accuse oriental orthodox churches today of being heretics and non-Christian. So a few years ago, there were some, some Egyptian Coptic, I think they were Egyptian, uh, there were some Coptic Christians who were beheaded on a beach. And uh, I remember one caustic, uh, constantly controversial blogger saying something like, well, these aren't Christians, so they weren't martyred uh, because they, they 
call themselves Miaphysites. And the issue is that um, Miaphysitism is, in, in those cases with Cyril and with uh, Oriental Orthodox churches, is commonly associated or really assumed to be monophysitism, which teaches that Jesus only had one nature. Uh, but Cyril's very clear about what he means by the term Miaphysis in the context, which I, Luke's going to read in just a second. And then the Oriental Orthodox churches today, and I, you know, I'm not an expert on Oriental Orthodoxy, but uh, from what I understand, um, they follow Cyril very closely on this. Uh, and so if they're following Cyril, uh, it's obvious that he's not positing monophysitism where Jesus actually has one nature, where they're mixed together to form some kind of tertium quid. It's not Eutychianism. So why don't you read the passage and then we'll... Yeah. And, and to be clear, we're not suggesting that Chalcedon is optional, right? I mean, that... that it, right. Maybe there's, uh, you know, in ecumenical conversations, they sometimes speak about a differentiated consensus. Um, I mean, I, I still think we should affirm Chalcedon as, as the standard of orthodoxy. I, and in that sense, I think that the, the Oriental Orthodox are wrong um, not to affirm it. But right. they may not be wrong in the same way that the, you know, early church Eutychians were wrong, right? Or and that's the Arians that's or, you know, something yeah. like this. Yeah. Right. Um, well, let me let me just clarify again that the issue with monophysitism and Eutychianism is that they deny that Christ possesses two distinct natures. That is not what Cyril says when he uses the term Miaphysis, and it's not what the Oriental Orthodox believe. Um, so I, I, I agree. I mean, I still think they're wrong, uh, but it's a much more complicated question than just saying, well, they're wrong about it, therefore they're heretics. Right. So um, earlier, uh, I was reading this quote from a Coptic bishop who says that um, they shouldn't be called monophysites because they always confess the continuity existence of the two natures in the one incarnate nature of the word of God. None of the natures cease to exist because of the union and the term Miaphysis denoting the incarnate nature is completely different from the term monophysites. The Oriental Orthodox do not believe in a single nat nature in Jesus Christ, but rather a united divine human nature. So you do hear it there, and we'll, we'll, you know, I'm going to let you read the passage and then we'll finish off with some discussion. But you do hear there, they're clearly affirming two distinct natures in one nature. Um, so there's some problematic ways in which they talk about the union. Uh, Chalcedon, I think rightly, says two natures in one person. And so I would disagree with the Coptic church and, uh, in that regard, but th they're not the same as monophysites or Eutychians where they're denying two natures sort of altogether. Right. Okay. So let's read the passage and then say yes. Yeah, so this is uh, on page 79 uh, in this version. Um, he says, my friend, if anyone says that when we speak of the single nature of God, the word incarnate, so there's, there's the controversial phrase, the single nature of God, the word incarnate and made man, we imply that a confusion or mixture has occurred, then they are talking utter rubbish. You gotta love the, the rhetoric here. Um, no one could convict us of saying this by the force of proper arguments and so on. So he, he's, he's, he says that obviously he's 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 fond of using this term uh the single nature or the one nature of god the word incarnate and he understands that some people could possibly misunderstand what he means by that right and just so you know like there th this phrase in cyril is hotly contested in scholarship of cyril and again i'm not an expert on this um you know we could point you to the to the to the resources you would need to to do research on uh, so there's debate about precisely what he means by this. There are differing interpretations about, you know, is this is this like a view that he later abandons, or is he saying something more rhetorical here as a kind of uh, dig on his opponents uh, to sort of overstate the point? Um, so again, there's differing interpretations here. But I think it's interesting that even in the context here, he's saying that even in speaking about a single nature of the Word of God incarnate, that doesn't mean that the two natures are confused or mixed. 
So he still wants to affirm, as he does throughout this book, that there's a distinction of the two natures. It's not that the two natures become one in the same way that the Eutychians argued, right? So that there's still uh, a distinction. And he uses, you know, some uh, some examples of that: the burning bush, the body and the soul in humanity, um, where there's a a, a a union of action in a sense but there's still a distinction between the two substances. Uh, if you go back a page or two on page 77, um, he says, but who would be so misguided and stupid as to think that the divine nature of the word had changed into something which formerly it was not, mm-hmm. or that the flesh was changed by some kind of transformation into the nature of the word itself. That, that's, that's standard textbook Eutychianism right there, right? Which he's denying. Yeah, and he's saying we, we're not saying Eutychianism. We're not saying that that the that the divine nature becomes human or the human nature becomes divine. Right, and we're right. also not saying that the divine nature sort of is turned off. Uh, at the, you know, so this would be anachronistic to say, but I think it's very clear that canonicism is ruled out by that right. language as well. And in a number of other places yeah. uh, in this book. Yeah. He goes on to say, then he does not have two natures, that of God and that of man. And he says, well, Godhead is one thing, manhood is another thing, consider in the, in the perspective of their respective and intrinsic beings. But in the case of Christ, they came together in a mysterious and incomprehensible union without confusion or change. That's the language, that's the exact language that Chalcedon will use. It's borrow, borrowing it from, mm-hmm. from Cyril the manner of this union is entirely beyond conception. So it's a mystery how this can be, but he's still uh, somehow is trying to, to affirm uh, the a real distinction of the natures, even though they're united together. Now, I, my take on this is that this language is so problematic and can potentially confusing that we should avoid it. I don't think that we should follow Cyril on this point to speak about a single nature of the, incar- of the word incarnate, because because of its tendency uh, to be confused uh, as saying something monophysite, one nature, or something Eutychian, that the two natures kind of are, are, are merged or confused. So I think we should avoid this. And I, you know, another question is, I, I don't think that Cyril is necessarily saying exactly the same thing that uh, the contemporary Oriental Orthodox are saying either, right? I mean, I think that Cyril can be understood in a way that's consistent with what comes with Chalcedon, but it's just important to recognize that the language is at least potentially confusing and we should probably avoid it, <laughs> right? I mean, I think that's my yeah. take. Yeah, that's right. So I don't, you know, again, um, on the on the language, I think Chalcedon is right to move away from one, one incarnate nature, that this kind of language of neophysis, uh, to one person. And, and Cyril, I think, actually uses I think you pointed out on page 83, he uses one prosopon, one person, um, to describe Jesus. So I think that's wise to uh, retain all of the the kind of syntax of Cyril, right? Where we, this is where we'd be talking about part of the of Jesus, et cetera, uh, but ad- uh, adapt the vocabulary just slightly, uh, moving away from Neophysis to, to one prosopon or, one, or really one hypostasis or one person. So uh, I think that's that's wise on Chalcedon's part, obviously. Um, and, you know, likewise, again, I agree what you said earlier, which is that the, you know, with the Oriental Orthodox, um, I disagree that they won't affirm Chalcedon, uh, but I don't think that, you know, again, just to kind of reiterate the point, we need to be clear that that doesn't mean they're the same thing as an Arian or an Astorian or a Eutychian. Um, and so you have to be very careful as you talk about uh, the tradition, orthodoxy, people's relation to it, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. So hopefully that's been a help to you as we've talked through Cyril's on the unity of Christ. Um, you know, it's a really, in many ways, seminal book uh, for a variety of reasons. And so we hope you've enjoyed it. I'll end us with the grace. Uh, and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.